Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our fireside chat tonight about unbiased leadership with uh, community experts. I uh, wanted to go through a quick introduction to Women Who Code before we get started tonight. Um, this is a, put on by the Silicon Valley chapter. And our mission with Women in Code is to inspire women to excel in technology careers. We have chapters in 122 countries and we have community members exceeding 230,000. In fact, uh, this is uh, Women Who Codes Digital Connect Week and they told, me, told us this week that we're up to 250,000. So if you're interested in uh, joining Women Who Code, uh, there are networks all over the world. Go to womenwhocode.com and look for your network. Uh, we have, this is our code of conduct. Um, our events are open to everyone who supports our mission. We're an inclusive community and we ask that everyone be respectful at our events. We don't tolerate harassment of our members in any form. And uh, this is the link to our full code of conduct. So at the end of this, I will uh, provide a link to our Slack channel if anybody wants to join our Silicon Valley Slack channel and a link to the a volunteer interest form. So if you're interested in, interested in volunteering for our chapter, we have a lot of ways that you can be become involved. I'll provide those at the end. And I want to go ahead and introduce our panel tonight. Uh, our moderator is Deepa Mohan, and I'm going to turn it over to her now. Deepa? Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Um, today we have an interesting um, set of panelists for um, the topic on um, unbiased leadership. Uh, we have um, Shiwan Bok from um, realtor.com and um, Joanne from Ladakora. So before we get started, I'd like for them to take a few minutes and introduce themselves. Shiwan, go ahead. Okay, sounds good. Hi everyone, my name is Shiwan Bok. I'm a, a, a finance VP uh, at realtor.com. Um, my experience, you know, I, I predominantly worked in finance. Uh, I know it's a little bit of a different industry than most of the folks here, um, but probably some, a lot of the rel relative, relevant experiences that might be helpful in discussing unbiased leadership. Um, I started in consulting. Um, I moved over still within the finance function, but moved over to the retail industry, which is pretty interesting. Um, at least from like a female dominated industry or female dominated com uh, companies at least. Um, and then uh, moved over to tech and, and kind of found a little bit of a different world here. So um, I think those experiences will pop up uh, as we discuss what leadership, um, unbiased leadership means. Hi everyone, so I'm Joanne. Um, I'm probably a little bit more traditional to probably the audience here. So I started my career at Microsoft. Uh, I was a QA engineer. From there, I continued to work at big companies. So Adobe, Symantec. Um, after Symantec, I actually joined Slack as a director of engineering. And that's where um, I got most of my, cut my startup teeth, so to speak. Um, and then for after that, I joined a company called Scoop, which uh, does carpool ride sharing. And then since leaving there, I took a little bit of time off. And then now about a month ago, I joined a small security, security services startup called Latacora. So um, my background is mostly for the past like five to six years, been managing departments of about 35 in engineering. All right, thank you, Joanne and Shiwan. Um, so um, just to give you a little bit of background um, on the topic, um, we all um, have bias um, and we need to acknowledge that it's part of uh, human makeup and uh, we use it to protect us from danger. 
we are hardware to prefer people who look like us, sound like us, and share our interests. But when it's left unchecked, these biases can have negative impact in all our interactions. With a lot of diversity um, that makes up our workforce, um, you know, there's a lot of um, um, interest in including more women, people of color, LGBTQ, veterans, both introverts and extroverts, immigrants, people with different abilities, thinking styles and personalities, and five generations to name a few, the level of complexity and potential conflicts that can arise is definitely bound to increase. So every day in workplace, we see that a lot of decisions are made based on bias. Whether we recognize or not, this unconscious bias enters into every component in the workplace. So now, today, we're going to talk to you, uh, both Shiwan and Joanne and find out their perspectives on how to be an unbiased leader. So without further ado, I'm going to start um, with a couple of questions um, that are of interest to the um, uh, community here. So let's get started with um, what is um, leadership bias? Um, and in order to be um, an inclusive leader who's um, uh, bias free, what are some of the key um, attributes that um, one would expect in a leader? So I'd like to hear from um, Joanne first um, from the engineering side of things, and then we can move on to uh, finance. So to me, leadership bias can range from so many different things, right? It can be from just not recognizing that you're promoting people who are more similar to you in management style to people, that, things that are a little bit more obvious of like people who actually look like you. Um, bias, as you said, can be very unconscious too. So sometimes it can just be like personalities where, you know, you promote the person that like you can actually joke with, right? Because it's who you feel comfortable with. And so leadership bias can show up in so many different ways. Um, to me, the key attributes of an inclusive leader are being able to be open-minded and to be able to admit that they're wrong, right? I think the biggest thing is no matter how you know, um, actively you're trying to think or address bias, you're gonna get it wrong sometimes. And to be able to actually say, hey, I got that wrong, help me get it right, or I wanna get it right, that's like one of the key attributes to me of an inclusive leader. Um, another key attribute to me is um, being able to listen, being open-minded and being able to listen without any sort of judgment or um, preconceived notion. Like, obviously you're gonna have some coming in, but to really try to tamp those down and to really listen to the other person. So Shiwan, um, do you have a different perspective or um, do you basically align with Joanne? Do you wanna to add to um, what she's, um mentioned about uh, leadership bias? Yeah, so um, I don't think I have something that's conflicts or is so different from what Joanne is saying, but um, maybe just a couple points that are uh, a little bit different um, or maybe uh, just from a different uh, point of view. Um, first though, I'd actually like to play two short videos. Um, they're about a minute long each. Can I flip over to those videos, Deepa? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, great. All right, bear with me as I share my screen here. All right, so um, the intro to this is, uh, these are two short clips from a show called 100 Humans. This show uh, airs on uh, Netflix. So if you have a Netflix subscription, you can go find it and actually play the whole show. But um, what I really like about these clips is, um, that, so this show was on bias. And what I really like about these clips is it really demonstrates, it really shows us um, what bias is. Um, I think what's interesting um, in this day and age, uh, you know, we're, we're all familiar with what leadership is, but when you add the word bias, you know, it becomes this whole new thing. So 
I just wanted to show this clip to, to help explain and help demonstrate what it means and the idea that all of us actually have inherent bias. So this is the first clip here. Hello. All right, so that's video one. I'm gonna play the second video, which I thought was especially compelling. Oh no. Well, I guess the second video isn't working. I think you get the idea though with the first video. Um, the idea is to say, ultimately, you know, we all think we're being unbiased and we don't think we really necessarily need to pay attention to it. But in reality, um, we're, we are all biased in some way. And when you assess yourself and when other people assess themselves, they always think they're not biased, but the reality is that we all are. So, um, so that was the that was um, kind of the point on uh, basically what is bias, um, and then as it relates to leadership or leadership bias, um, I think it's one of those things where um, you have to think about um, how you show up as a leader. If you're not thinking about how you are being biased or trying to strive for being unbiased, then by default you are being biased. Um, I think that the key attributes for an inclusive leader include um, pulling the facts and sticking to them and uh, making sure always to get external feedback. So, um, you know, 360 feedbacks is something that I know our company is, uh, is starting to implement, um, which I think is a really great idea. You get feedback from, you know, people above you, people below you and, pe and your peers and such so that you get a really good view um, of uh, what your tendencies are um, and what your biases are. And then the second piece is, um, you know, as you're looking at your team, uh, I really think that you need to um, assess ability and contribution and look at those alone um, side by side, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, being biased or, or looking at folks um, in, in any other light. So I think looking at the facts is a really important way of um, being an inclusive leader and being unbiased. Yeah, that is um, very, very um, nice way of um, describing uh, uh, about um, unconscious bias, which exists everywhere and how we can um, get over that and uh, make decisions um, in a fair manner. So typically, um, how does bias look like in the workplace? And um, how do we actually become aware of this bias to start with? Um, and how can we encourage um, employees to be, to be aware of bias in the workplace um, and recognize that and overcome that? Um, Shuan, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I actually have like a, you know, a good example. So um, this is back when I was working at another company. Um, I, I was relatively new to the role. I was a people manager at the time. And um, I had a direct report, um, you know, her name was Sarah, we'll just call her Sarah. And um, I remember my VP at the time was saying, you know, take your time, you can assess Sarah, make sure that um, she's up to snuff, she's doing her job well, so on and so forth. And so, um, you know, I'd taken maybe a month or two to really work with Sarah and understand, um, you know, her abilities and where she can go. And then I sat down with the VP and the VP had asked me like, hey, so what do you think about Sarah? And I said, you know, Sarah is, you know, still an analyst. She's still learning. She's got a way to go. She has skill sets to develop. And I said, and, and you know, said a couple of things. And uh, my VP said, so, so what do you think about her critical thinking skills? And I said, well, I don't think that she's demonstrated critical thinking skills um, in my time here so far. And my VP immediately was like, I knew it, she's not a critical thinker. And then I could see like in that moment, she had dismissed my direct report. Uh, in that moment, it was, it was like a, you know, it was like a snap of a finger. Um, and, and I think that happens a lot. And I think that happens all the time. And I think that's also unfortunate because we're all always along a journey. We're all always still developing and trying to become, to fulfill the roles that we are given, fulfill our jobs, complete our deliverables and increase our skill sets as we go. So, so that I think was a really good example that I recall 
um, that was a really good example of bias in the workplace. Awesome, Shiwan. So that story um, is a good example of how um, people just form biases instantly and make decisions which are really not favorable um, to others, right? So, yeah. So in, uh, I have a follow-up question to this, which um, I, um, Joanne, could you answer? It's about how do you actually become mindful of your bias during these conversations? Are, are there something that you can... Um, something that you can do? Is there something that you can do to prevent yourself from getting into a situation where your bias is coming into play in making some you know, major decisions like uh, promotion or layoff or whatever? So um, could you throw some light on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one thing that Shiwan said earlier that I, I do have to call out about is that I have seen 360 feedback be problematic, right? And it's because the individual writing it has their own bias, sometimes has their own, um, you know, end goals in mind and things. And so you really have to be careful as a manager when you read that 360 feedback to also understand like the color in which this might be happening, right? Because I've, I've definitely had it where I've had um, people working together and like there was some conflict where they knew that they were both up for the same promotion and like it wasn't necessarily the most um, inclusive environment. And so people would you know, potentially put down somebody else for their own personal gain. Um, in terms of your question, though, Diva, uh, like to actually counter bias um, as a manager, I think you have to really kind of understand the holistic picture of everything, right? Um, I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest um, trainings that I once did around unconscious bias was we went around the room and we asked everybody like, well, what was your childhood solution to the common cold, right? And just like the answers varied so much and just seeing how, you know, what it kind of made me aware of is like bias comes from like the smallest things, right? From the time we were young and how our parents took care of us with a cold or if we didn't actually have parents who cared about us, they think that was really important. And so I think for me, um, when I try to counter that bias, I try to remember that anytime I'm making a decision that like, you know, everybody's going to come to the table with their own experiences. And it's really important to listen to everybody. Um, but I also try to make decisions in a way where I'm not just looking at, you know, talking to people in management, because I feel like sometimes they're not the ones on the ground who know, right. And I like to instead kind of pull almost a random sample of people to kind of better understand like how this might affect people, right? I've definitely been in situations where I've had to make a decision and like, I've talked to somebody on the ground. I'm like, they gave me a whole new perspective that I had never even considered. Um, you know, and sometimes you have to make a decision for the business that not everyone's going to agree with. But at least as a leader, I feel better that I've gotten that perspective, because if nothing else, when I have to make that decision, what I like to think through is, how am I going to actually counter this person when I when I actually have to announce the decision I've made, right? Um, I hope that's kind of what you're looking for here, like in terms of how I do it in particular. I'm not saying that the way that I'm doing it is right, but like that's how I try to do it, where I try to get as many different perspectives as I can, because if I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to have to defend it. And then that way, like when I actually make the decision, you know, nothing's really surprising me. Like I've gotten the whole perspective from lots of people. Yeah. That is That sounds very, very um, logical and objective, um, Joanne. Um, so you're really not letting your own bias come into play there and you're getting um, all the required uh, feedback from you know people that um, are getting picked randomly right not yeah. yeah not having any of your bias um, in mind yeah I try not to have favorites that I ask people I try to just choose a random smattering of people for you know, and sometimes I even scare people because after you become an exec, they're like, why are you talking to me? What <laughs> did I do something wrong? And I'm like, no, no, I just want to know your perspective. So, yeah, yeah. So that's very fair. So, so are there tools that uh, companies provide to leaders, especially leaders in exec roles to sort of train how to maintain this objectivity that you're referring to, 
to counter bias in workplace? And if so, what are these tools? And how do you um, make sure that um, employees in the organization have access to those tools? And uh, what are some of the things that you as a leader would do to make sure that other managers and other individual contributors in, on your team is aware of um, all the different things that they can do to prevent bias from um, actually um, getting, in, getting in the way um, while making um, decisions. So Joanne, you can go first, or if Shuan, you wanna, um, you have a different perspective than Joanne, you can um, answer now. Joanne, do you want to go first or you want me to go first? <laughs> oh, it's up to you. And if you had another perspective, like feel free. Oh, um, so, so, well, as it relates to tools, I, I feel like that's a little bit of a different subject. So um, maybe I'll make a few comments and, uh, and Joanne, you can um, sure. uh, supplement. Um, so, so I think the first thing that a company should be doing is actually reevaluating basically every system and process from the lens of anti-bias. And so the reason why I say that is because, um, you know, I'll give you an example of something that we're, do we're doing at our company. Um, so, um, you know, we have a vendor, and this is a finance example, forgive me. Um, we have a vendor program where, um, you know, we will look for new vendors, we will evaluate and assess the vendors that we have today. Um, make sure that they're doing the right thing for the business, that the relationship is good, so on and so forth. Um, but when that was put together, it was put together from the lens of just finance and process. We didn't have the lens of, are we being biased, uh, you know, as we uh, go about assessing our vendors. So actually what we're doing is we are reevaluating that process um, from top to bottom, reviewing um, all of our documents and such, but from the lens of bias. So one of the things that came from that is we are actually instituting a diversity program within our vendor base. So what that means is as we go about assessing new vendors, um, deciding whether they're going to be or they could be um, you know, supplying services to us or not, um, we are also making sure that the pool of vendors from which we are assessing uh, that they that we have diverse candidates in that pool as well. So, for example, um, is at least one of those business women owned? Is at least one of those businesses minority owned? So that when we're making that assessment, we're make we're starting from a, a place of really just not bias, just not people that we know before or someone had a relationship with someone else. And so, I think that's a really good example of where you know, af as a result of um, reviewing our programs with that lens of anti bias. Um, we're able to make some changes there. Um, I think that same example applies to interviewing, you know, uh, making sure that you're, uh, and that, that would just be another example of where you would want to take that lens of anti-bias, um, making sure that your candidate pool is very diverse before you start interviewing so that whoever rises to the top uh, and ultimately you make an offer to really comes from a really good um, uh, candidate base. Um, let's see. Another thing that we do that I really like um, at Realtor is um, we have a women's ERG. We also have a diversity ERG, uh, which is an employee resource group. Um, and uh, what's really great about uh, something that happened pretty recently is one of the members of the ERG um, actually redid our org structure, except organized it by gender. So basically the same org structure and identified all the positions but then grouped direct reports by male and female. And it becomes actually pretty clear, um, you know, which folks end up uh, hiring mainly mostly male uh, and which folks end up hiring mainly mostly female. So there's actually quite a bit of, um, you know, data organization you can do in order to, um, you know, take a look at how your organization is doing. Um, Maybe two more things here. Uh, the, the third thing I would point out is uh, there's a lot of really good books out there that can help um, understand, help you understand like what biases and how it might apply to leadership. Um, the first book I'd point out is Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, that book is predominantly about the split second judgments that we make about 
a person, a situation, a thing, a place, you know, whatever it is, um, based off of our biases. And so it's really important to acknowledge that that happens. And that book will tell you what that kind of is and how that shows up, manifests in our lives. Um, but then the idea around, you know, to, to do that um, in the context of work can be very dangerous. So he talks about that as well. Um, the second book I totally recommend is Edge by Laura Huang. She talks about um, what it means to uh, figure out how to turn your disadvantages into strengths. And while it's not like directly related to leadership bias or being unbiased in a leadership position, I think what it does is it helps you understand like how to make yourself stand out so that you're less prone um, to being uh, subject to bias. Um, and then the last thing, which I think is really cool, and this is maybe a little bit less about the tools, but more about maybe a strategy is um, how to identify bias to begin with. And um, this idea I uh, recalled from a book I read recently, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, Cast is a book about, um, it's like loosely based off of racism, but her point on it is that we're not in a racist society, we live in a caste system. And there's much more about that, that um, you know, if you're, you're interested, you can read the book. But, but the concept there that I thought was really cool about um, identifying what bias looks like is um, take a situation where you felt like someone was being biased against you or take a situation where you observed that bias and then replace it with the opposite of where you think um, the bias wouldn't have existed. So, um, you know, someone's yelling at you or something like that. If you were, and you think it's because you're a woman, if you were a man, would that person be yelling at you still? If you were, I don't know, wh whatever bias it is, if you were younger, if you were older, if you were white, if you were black, replace the situation with the opposite and replay it in your head. That is a really, really great way of identifying whether you think bias exists or not. Because if it looks absurd in the other direction, in the other way, then there's likely bias happening there. So um, yeah, so those are the couple things that I would mention, uh, you know, when as organizations explore how they try to become more and more unbiased or infuse their leaders with the idea of becoming more and more unbiased. Uh, those are the couple things that come to mind. Wow, Shuan, that's a lot of um, information about uh where to go to to get details about uh, bias and how to be aware of it. Joanne, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I mean, first off, I think you, want, you, you listed a lot of books. So if you could put those in the chat so people could find them, that would probably be really helpful. Yes. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest tools that I got when I was at Slack actually was they partnered with a, with a nonprofit called Code 2040, which was trying to get enough um, to have, I think, the representation in the tech community mirror that of um, the world, I think. Uh, I can't remember exactly the, the mission there. Um, but Carla Monterosa taught uh, an un unconscious bias training there. And what was wonderful is like, I convinced Slack to bring it in-house to actually like teach all the managers about unconscious bias because that was one of the best trainings that I ever had. Like they taught about how bias can show up in so many different ways, including like, um, did you have to wear hand-me-down clothes as a child, right? And like how that might affect you when you present yourself at work. And so that was one of the best things that I've ever had. I think the organization has changed since I moved on from Slack. So I don't know if they still provide that type of training. Um, but honestly, that was one of the best things that I've ever experienced. Uh, in terms of tools that organizations provide, I think this is such a human problem that it's really hard to apply like a software tool or some other type of tool to it. I really love Shuan's idea of like switching the, the situation and seeing what that looks like. Um, I have definitely done that before. I've had some, I know we get into this in further questions, but I've definitely had um, male coworkers tell me like, like they've snapped me out of things before. They're like, Joanne, if you weren't a woman, they never would have done that to you. And I'm just like, whoa, what? <laughs> like, and, you know, having those type of allies has been extremely helpful. Um, and I think that's like something that 
is like a really good tool to have. I haven't seen any like actual software tools that help this. You know, there's tons that say they do, but I, I haven't seen one where it's like truly been effective in affecting change and like cultural change at the core of a company. I yeah. know that Adam has posted in the chat about data is a good way to check, but I maybe he has a tool. I don't know, <laughs> yeah. or they yeah. have a tool. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see um, where, um, you know, it, it's hard to actually have like um, an application or like um, training class to um, get people um, to, uh, to be aware of uh, bias. However, you know, if you have an ERG or something, you can basically um, have sessions um, to make people aware of bias and see how they can um, overcome that to make um, more uh, meaningful decisions. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I think that I have experienced with ERGs that I, I caution people on is that a lot of times I think um, a lot of times companies will then re rely on the ERG to affect change. And I think that's where like, it's not fair, right? It's like, it's not fair that you are then saying like, okay, ERG, tell me what I'm supposed to do to suddenly yeah. <laughs> be yeah. inclusive. I'm like, no, like yeah. you got to do some work here too. So yeah. that's just my, I don't mean to be cynical. It's just to also be aware of that. Like don't put the burden on an ERG. Yeah. Yeah. I think it has to be a collaborative effort um, uh, between, you know, uh, managers and leaders in the company and ERG to uh, bring about um, some sort of um, transformation um, to enable employees to become aware of bias and um, see how they can make decisions outside of that. So uh, now, now there are, I have some interesting um, questions here around gender bias. And I'm sure um, a lot of us um, have had many experiences um, around gender bias. So I, I wanna understand how in a male dominated um, industry, how you're able to advocate for yourself um, being, you know, uh, women. And did you ever have to, um, you know, collide with a glass ceiling that sort of um, limited you and your growth um, based on your gender? And how do you actually, as leaders, how do you help other women advance in their careers? So it's all about how this gender bias um, is playing a role um, in the um, industry. So let's start with um, Joanne first and see how things are playing out in engineering where um, so far I've seen uh, that um, there are more men than women, um, yeah. I mean, it's definitely changed. When I started my career, geez, I think like over 15 years ago, I, I remember not getting any help, you know, and feeling like I was just the random one woman amongst like 30 male engineers. And like, that's just how it was. I dealt with like a lot of sexism, a lot of um, inappropriate jokes, a lot of people like what would probably count as sexual harassment, you know, and um, at the time I didn't even think anything of it. It was just my norm. It was my day to day. And like, it's taken a lot of time to kind of untrain that out of me that like, no, that's not normal. Like you should not accept that. Um, in terms of gender bias, I, I was lucky. I had a lot of um, women managers early in my career and my mom is a software developer or I mean, she was, she's retired now, but like, so I had a lot of good female mentors in my life. And so I didn't necessarily feel the same glass ceiling that some women have experienced. However, I have experienced, and this is pretty terrible, um, the experience where women hold each other down. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that we never talk about in this industry where we're always like, women, we support each other, but that's not actually true in reality. There are, there are, it's, it's a cutthroat world. And like, <laughs> sometimes women do hold each other down. And I think um, that can be something that, you know, I really, I really want to encourage people to be like, there's no reason why we can't all succeed together, you know? And even if there's only one position, like, you know, if I get promoted over somebody else, like I'm gonna try to help them find, you know, other opportunities or something, right? Like, I think that's the biggest thing where, you know, in order to succeed, like, especially because it's a male dominated industry, at least in engineering, it's like, 
we we forget that like there should actually be a team camaraderie in this and not just like a sense of individual self and so i think it's really um i think it's just really important to support each other and to not like hold each other back um when i've advocated for myself honestly i think i have i've had really good allies so i've made friends with um, you know, male colleagues who were either in higher positions or in the same position as me. Uh, I'm definitely not age biased at all. Some of my best career decisions have been made with a friend of mine who was like, he, he joined Adobe when it was a startup. <laughs> so you can imagine how a while ago it was. Um, but he used to tell me things like, no, don't accept that for a salary. <laughs> like, you know, you know that this person's going to be paid at least 50k more than that. Keep asking for more. Like, stop stop stopping yourself. And I um, had another male colleague who um, he passed away, actually, but he used to be my biggest cheerleader, you know, he'd be like, stop putting yourself down, look at all the different companies you work for, you've done like developer tooling, you've done like consumer products, and now you're moving into enterprise, like, you're a jack of all trades, don't, you know, and so I think it's really important to have advocates that like, kind of help you turn off that inner critic of yourself, right? That imposter syndrome, so. Yeah, yeah so that's good to hear that you have been fortunate enough to find many um, male advocates and allies who've actually been your uh, big support um, in your growth. And Siobhan, do you ha have you had similar experiences or um, in finance or is it way different? You know, um, I was just thinking about that. Uh, you know, I think my experience is a little bit different from Joanne's. Um, and I think it's a par partially because of who I am and how I've uh, conducted my career. Um, and I think I did a little, I think I did a little bit of the glass ceiling to myself, if that makes any sense. So, so similar to Joanne, like I think there are, there are places where, um, you know, I doubted myself, I was critical of myself, overly critical of myself. Um, I think we as women do that um, a lot uh, where uh, we kind of have this self doubt. Um, we're always just criticizing ourselves. But the reality is for every woman who does that, there's gonna be a man who um, you know, pats himself on the back and <laughs> sings their own praises, right? So, right? so I think there's a thing here about, you know, figuring out how to stand up for yourself, how to speak up for yourself, how to speak um, of your experiences in a way that uh, puts you on a level playing field as everyone else. So, so I think that's there for sure. Um, let's see, I do wanna go back to the idea of like the idea of gender bias. Um, you know, gender bias does also exist in the finance world uh, and um, very much so uh, when you get to banking and consulting and kind of the more like Wall Street uh, type of jobs, uh, definitely experienced uh, some of those things that Joanne has experienced as well, um, sort of the, the sexist comments and things like that. I remember, um, I have to share this story. I remember um, I, I, I went to business school and, and at the time only about 20 to 30% of business school uh, graduates were, were women. And that actually is, 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 wasn't that bad. I, I thought that was actually pretty good <laughs> when I went to business school. Now it's around 40% or 45%, which is even better. But um, I recall um, I was sitting in this like women's uh, group and there were some employees of a consulting company that had come, female employees of a consulting company that had come to talk, in a, to talk about their experiences. And one of the topic obviously topics was um, uh, how do you uh, work in an environment that's predominantly male dominated? And I remember the answer was something like, um, oh, well, our office is really into NASCAR. The guys are really into NASCAR. So what I decided to do is also be really into NASCAR. And so I learned about what NASCAR was about. And then now I really love it. And now we have something in common to talk about. So, you know, I remember sitting there thinking like, is, is this what it's come to? Is this what we have to do in order to um, thrive in a male dominated industry? Um, needless to say, I did not apply to that consulting company, but, um, but, but I feel like um, there is a piece here on, um, you know, it, it's, it's there and it's always been there. Maybe it was a little bit more obvious and explicit and like in your face before 
but it's still there. Actually, to some extent, extent, I feel like it's even harder to define and harder to identify because it takes much more subtle forms. Um, so, so I guess, um, yes, I did experience gender bias. Um, and, and what does it look like now? I feel like it's a little bit different. I do go back to that idea of like putting, putting, you know, uh, someone else in your place, like if you're feeling it or if you're experiencing it, um, it'll help you view almost like the situation in sort of a third party so that you can identify it and, and ideally combat it. Identify it first and then be able to do something about it. Yeah, that, that's a very um, interesting way of looking at things. And I do agree with you that as women, we always strive for perfection. We are usually, we are very hard on ourselves and that can actually um, create more um, challenges in moving forward uh, when um, our counterparts don't feel the same way, right? So, yeah. So um, I... Related to this, um, I'm, I'm, I always ask myself, um, why do women not get promoted that often? Um, and even if they do, um, it's usually like, you know, um, the manager has no other options and this woman has been around uh, doing the same job for like five years and um, they're kind of worried that she might leave. So let's promote her kind of thing. Or you know there is a downturn and um, they're losing a lot of people and um, they want to make sure that um, she gets promoted so they can keep the team intact or whatever, right? So it's it's not like hey um, she's doing a great job let's promote her no matter what. So I've never heard anybody uh, any anyone in my friend circle say that they um, got promoted without uh, putting in. Um, effort into uh, this uh, promotion process, right? It's not like they did um, all the good work and they got promoted automatically. So do you happen to know why that's the case? And have you experienced that? Um, what are the different ways to um, um, actually prevent that from happening and um, um, help uh, women get promoted just like their counterparts? Shiwan, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, you know, I've definitely experienced this myself. I uh, worked at Old Navy for a long time earlier in my career. And, you know, as every year passed, I would wonder, why am I not getting promoted? Uh, and why is everyone else around me getting promoted? I could not see a difference between the work quality. Um, I think there was a little bit of a difference in terms of like what I ended up working on. Um, but uh, ultimately, as I kind of look back at that time frame, I do recall there was a moment where I made a decision for myself. I just said, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to get promoted, even if I'm not ready for that next role, or if I've self-assessed that I'm not ready for that next role. Um, I'm going to speak up for myself. I'm going to claim uh, the work that I do, so on and so forth. Um, so it was also at that company where I've had a former boss take my work and present it as if it were his, not publicly give me um, acknowledgement for that work. Uh, and, and there were many examples of these types of things that would happen uh, throughout the course of my experience there. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think there's something wrapped up in that where, you know, we talked a little bit about self-criticism. We talked a little bit about how women kind of uh, hold themselves down a little bit sometimes. Um, or maybe a lot sometimes. And so I, I do think that in this world, you kind of have to make a decision. Do you kind of raise your hand and say, um, you know, I, I believe that I don't need to be any different than who I am right now, but I deserve a promotion. Or do you look at the world and say, this is a characteristics, these people who raise their hands and speak up for themselves are the ones who are getting promoted. So I think I need to learn how to do that too. And so I chose to do the latter. I think fighting, especially now, we do have to do some of it. And I think actually this, this panel uh, and this talk is actually a really good example of how you get the awareness out, you have people get the ideas in their head and you start to fight. But in the meantime, what do you do, do when these biases still exist? I really think that you still need to make some choices about how you're gonna conduct yourself and for me, that choice became, um, you know, raise my hand, call attention to the work that I do. 
Um, and, I, and I think the way that I do it helps too. I tend to um, crack a joke or I will, you know, make light of a situation or, um, you know, I will say, you know, like if someone says great work, thank you so much. I'll say, thanks so much. Make sure my boss knows um, or something like that. Right. Like, and, and that's just my brand and the way that I've done things in the past and, and a little bit now, you just have to find what that is for you and know that this is separate thinking outside of just doing good work. I, I um, you know, I was raised on the idea of like, keep your head down, do good work, work hard, and you'll be rewarded. It doesn't really work that way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you kind of have to speak up for yourself. And if someone tries to steal your work, you've got to point it out and you've got to, you know, fight for what's, what belongs to you. So, so um, that, that's, that's probably, that's probably what I'd mention. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like we need to play a strong advocate for our own selves to management and almost everybody that we work with um, to be able to um, get to a level where we want to be. Joanne, do you agree um, or do you have a different take on this? No, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly. I've definitely had the manager who took responsibility for my work. And, um, you know, I tried to confront and actually say like, hey, I heard you took responsibility for this. Like, what was the situation? Of course, um, you know, that sort of uh, upfront confrontational thing has been learned over years of like, I'm not going to sit down when somebody's going to take credit for my work anymore. Um, but it was definitely hard, right? And because this person was my manager, like it was, it was very difficult. And I'm sure somewhat career limiting that I had done this as well. Um, but you know, to your point, Deepa and Shimon, what you're saying is like, a lot of people who get promoted are the ones who self promote, right? And we have to stop kind of stopping ourselves from doing that self-promotion, right? Like I grew up very traditional Asian. You just put your head down, you do your work, like you get the good grades, you know, rewards, whatever. But that's not what happens in industry, right? In industry, it's the squeaky wheel who gets the worm and whatever, the squeaky wheel who gets the race. <laughs> that's right. I like, wait, the early work. Uh, anyways, it's uh, COVID. I, my brain doesn't work anymore. Um, but, you know, I think there is something to be said where I've had women come to me wondering why they weren't getting promoted. I'm like, honestly, because I don't know what you do. You work in this other part of the company and like, but I know what all these other people do. And so if they're like out there promoting themselves, like you kind of have to be a little bit louder in order to like really get promoted. And I think, you know, there was a bit where I, you know, I have been passed up for promotion before and it's because I was head down just trying to get stuff done, you know, and I didn't care about the reward of it. But ultimately, that hurt my career, you know, and that at some point, you have to decide, how do you want to live your life? What is genuine to y your authentic self, right? And for me, like, at some point, I was like, you know what, I don't care about the promotion, I'm not going to be able to live with myself if I don't finish this work, I, I just need to get the work done. Screw the promotion, it's fine. Like, it's okay that like, they're going to pass me up this time. And it was hard, right? It was a hard acceptance, because I'm somebody who's very driven. Uh, and I, you know, like once you start on the career ladder, you're like, oh, I got to keep going. Right. And it's like, wait, no, do I really want that promotion? Like it's going to come with all this other responsibility. No, for me, what I want to do is actually finish this. Right. But when people come to me, especially earlier in their career, I'm like, no, you have to get, get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yes. You have to say, I did an amazing job at the TGC, like, you know, and really promote yourself. And it's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to feel like, oh, I'm conceited or arrogant or whatever. No, it's you're, you're proud of your own work and that's okay. Like that's something you should absolutely do. Yeah, I agree. And uh, as long as we are within limits uh, uh, around how we're uh, promoting ourselves, I think it's going to earn good results. Yeah. Um, so, but are there any metrics um, to measure a company's um, ability to counter the effects of uh, gender bias? Have you come across any metrics that we can use to measure, um, you know, how different companies, right? You've worked in different companies. How are they actually countering the effects of gender bias? Joanne, looks like you want to say something. Yeah. Well, for me, honestly, I look at how many women are in leadership positions. You know, I mean, my current company is tiny. We're all of 25 people, but like, I look at how many women are in leadership positions and how um, they're trying to change that, right? If it's not 50-50, how are they trying to change it? 
um, you know, my current company has all of like three people <laughs> in leadership positions, one of them being me. So I feel like it's fine. But you know, like for larger companies, I look at that where I'm like, okay, one of the biggest things that I remember Stuart Butterfield, the CEO of Slack at the time said to me was like, I want to hire women because my biggest success is if you move on to some other company and are in a leadership position there, right? And I want to work for people like that. I don't want to work for people who don't care or don't look at the metrics because I think to me, that's the, that's the easiest metric. How many women are there total in the company? How many are leadership positions? How many have gotten promoted in the past year? Like, um, and not just women, right? People of color, anyone up underrepresented, like, you know, how are they actually trying to, to change the norm or like what the current status quo? Yeah, that I, I completely agree with that. Um, Siwan, do you have a different take on that? Or do you have other metrics to measure um, how um, much a company is working towards countering the um, gender bias? Yeah, um, what I've seen uh, that other companies do is um, actually publish a report. It's like a for, for public companies, they'll actually publish a report and say, here's the balance between women and men in our company. Here's the breakouts and bands of like the salaries for women versus men, et cetera. Um, so, so there are things like that that are out there. Um, it, it really is kind of up to you though, as a company, up to the company to figure out what metrics make sense for them and how they want to call out and measure um, just like creating OKRs and, and trying to hit them. So. Uh, I would keep that pretty broad because it can mean different things to different companies. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And um, along the same lines, do you have any advice for women in early career um, who are sort of um, new to the industry, right? Who are like right out of the university and all that and how to handle unconscious bias because they haven't been in um, workforce for long. They may have done a few internships here and there. Um, are there anything else that you want to recommend to the early career women who actually joined um, today's Zoom call? Um, and they're, they're all, I know these days, everybody's aware that we, need, we all need um, mentors, right? So uh, especially people who are right out of college, who are like getting in the industry, they're looking to find mentors. And um, if there's anything that you can add um, along those lines as well, that'll uh, truly help. Yeah, so uh, the, the biggest piece of advice that I would give is um, be, be prepared for it. Uh, develop your strong sense of self. And I know that takes time and effort and you have to work on yourself, but um, as you go through your career, it's not just about completing the deliverables and checking off the boxes. It's also figuring out what, is, what it is that you want and who you want to be. Uh, so it's much better to be prepared or bias that will happen to you in the future and have an idea of how you want to respond as opposed to having it happen to you and you not being aware of it or prepared for it. It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, even if you never do a fire drill, even if you just look at the map on the wall and say like, okay, how do I mentally, how do I walk out the building, uh, you know, in case there's a fire, if there is ever a fire, then it's much easier to think about that map and actually leave the building than to be completely caught off guard, which is why we do fire drill to begin with. But um, you should do the same thing for when it comes to handling unconscious or conscious, any type of bias. Uh, so that's sort of my, my first um, comment. The second thing I would say is in terms of a um, uh, uh, mentor, I think the question also asks something about, um, uh, do, do you have to have a female mentor and I think the answer is no. So I know Joanne said earlier, and, and I totally believe this is true sometimes, sometimes even women um, are extremely biased against other women. So, it, and, and to a large extent, it's almost, it could actually even be better to have a male mentor who can point out to you exactly Joanne's, Joanne's experience. So um, who can point out to you like, oh, this is what a man would have done. You should think about it from that lens. So, so I think having a male mentor could even be perhaps even better uh, than a female mentor sometimes for the fact that they can point those things out. Um, Cheryl Sandberg's mentor was her male college professor uh, and that seemed to work out pretty well for her. So, um, so yeah, you know, I think, I think you can go anywhere for a mentor. Um, kind of an interesting thing for me personally though, like I, I never, 
I would not really be able to identify for you anyone that I actually took on as a mentor. Um, you know, I'm kind of one of those outliers, I guess, to a certain extent. For me, it was much more about making that decision uh, and reaching out to people in a mentor-like fashion, asking for advice and things like that. Um, but I never, I would never be able to point to someone and say, yes, this person was my mentor. So, so I think there's a piece where um, if you're not, if you don't have a mentor, uh, you don't know how to navigate, you can still um, develop a sense of self-awareness and make a decision about what you want. Make that map, make that, um, uh, you know, building map so that you know what to do in the fire drill. That's neat, um, Shiwan, that you were able to give us an example of um, how you didn't have a specific mentor, but then um, you actually had like a lot of people in your workforce that you could um, look at and um, uh, sort of um, use them as examples to move forward. Um, so Joanne, do you uh, want to add to this? Do you have a different perspective? Do you want to talk about um, your mentors and you know what ad specific advice um, that you would give to uh, women who are um, right out of college? Yeah, I mean, I think to combat the un unconscious bias, honestly, is I, I can't remember her name. She spoke at Grace Hopper one year when I went, but she had this saying of, don't stop until you get a bouquet of no's, right? And what she meant by that is like, to combat that bias, like there, there might be one person who says no, you don't have to take that no, keep, keep asking, right? Until you get a bouquet of no's, it's not a, it's not a no, just keep going, right? And then that way you kind of know like, okay, that's just one person's opinion, that's okay, right? Like I can take it or leave it, whatever, but that's just one person. So that way, you know, it's like, okay, was it just bias or was it actually like good feedback, right? And so to me, I always remember that it's like, until I hear it from multiple people and it becomes a theme, it doesn't, you know, it's just one data point. Um, in terms of choosing a mentor, I think, you know, I, I've had formal mentors, I've had informal mentors, I've just had friends who I considered mentors, people who are further along in my career. I think the most important thread through all of them is trust. Like you just need to find someone you connect with and that you actually trust, right? Because for a mentor to be effective, you really have to be able to open up to them about some sticky situations, right? And like, they may have to ask you some difficult questions to really get you to think about like, to open up your perspective and open up your mind of what's happening. And so just find people that you actually trust. Right, yeah, I agree. So even my mentor and I, we are of the same wavelength. And when I say, when I explain um, specific scenarios or um, situations to her, she's able to relate to that and um, give me advice on how to um, move forward as opposed to like, you know, why do you even have this kind of question? Um, if you get such questions from a person, then it just means that, you know, you're not going to get the right kind of um, advice to move forward. All right. So um, switching gears a little bit, I know Joanne covered a little bit on the age bias, but I would like to hear from Shiwan on whether she's seen or experienced um, age bias. Yeah, age bias is an interesting one. I think that uh, in many ways, I feel like age bias is, is almost worse or harder to um, combat uh, than like gender bias or you know, other, other types of bias. Um, so for me, the way that I have seen it manifest is um, you know, when you're, uh, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example that's like actually close to me. Um, so my area of responsibility includes strategic sourcing, which is the vendor, the idea of the ven of onboarding vendors, uh, maintaining a vendor base, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're we hire for analysts. Uh, we hire, we have a couple positions open. And one of the positions that we had recently opened was a, was an analyst position. Um, you have to be very explicit about what you are differentiating between what you want in the role versus whether you think you're being biased about a certain number of years of experience. Uh, and I say that explicitly and it's very, very apparent in the sourcing world because you have some folks who 
um, have been in sourcing for 20, 30 years, and they kind of do the same thing, uh, transactional uh, type processing. And then there are some folks who lean more on the strategy side where they're building decks and they're you know, building programs and, and things like that. And so um, you know, as I'm getting resumes in, and you call it you know, a sourcing analyst, it's a very generic title, so you get all sorts of resumes. You have to be very, very careful about looking at the resume and saying, oh my gosh, they have 20 years of experience, and then dismissing it as um, it's not the right position, it's not the right person. Because I'm looking for the strategy person you really have to look, again, it comes down to like looking at the facts, what's on their resume? What experiences do they have? Do they have a portion of their experience that would fit well with the strategic role that I'm looking for? And you have to look through the resumes that way. And to a large extent, that really is more about putting the responsibility on yourself again, um, you know, as you're looking through the resumes, as you're making the decisions on, um, you know, whether this person should go through to an interview or not. And so that's, a, for me, that was the most compelling example of where age bias comes in. You have to be very careful to combat that in order to make sure that that doesn't happen at your company, with you, wherever. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, because in soft, on the software side, I'm noticing that a lot of the companies are sending out um, like interview questionnaire to their um, prospective um, employees or candidates um, to figure out how they're doing um, as opposed to looking at their um, resume and asking them um, technical questions. So Joanne, um, what's your take on um, age bias um, aside from what you already talked about and from the interviewing um, st uh, standpoint? I mean, age bias definitely exists. I, like, I, I would say that Many of the people I've hired who are in the like protected category of over 40, that's crazy, I'm turning 40 this year, but whatever, uh, <laughs> you know, they, you know, after I've hired them have told me some very horrific stories in my opinion, right? Where it's like, you know, they, they actually will drop their experience from their resume. They'll take off things like uh, the year that they graduated from college, even on LinkedIn, because, you know, people will look and then calculate and, um, I think age bias definitely exists. For me, I view age as a huge bonus, right? <laughs> You've seen so many things. Uh, usually with the more seasoned engineers, uh, I think what I end up seeing is like, they have perspective, you know? <laughs> it's like, they're the ones who don't panic when like there's an outage, they're like, I got this, like, calm down, we'll be fine. Um, and so I actually view age as a bonus and so, the best way that I've been able to combat it is honestly when I give reference calls for these, for folks that I know who are older, I'm like, no, you definitely want this person. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of people too, though, who are in those protected age categories who honestly, sometimes they're the ones telling themselves no. And I'm like, stop doing that. Like, you know, you are valuable. Like, it doesn't matter that you have gray hair, <laughs> just go for it, you know? Um, and so it's hard, like it definitely exists, but it's tough. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Life experiences matter a lot. And, um, and having that um, confidence in you to be able to handle difficult um, situations, you really can't discount that when we are hiring people. Um, so switching gears, we are like pretty close to um, 625 um, here. Um, so have you had any interesting situations um, in the workplace where you were challenged to be a bias-free leader, like, you know, any um, stories that you want to share? Um, Shivan, you can go first. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel like I've actually not been challenged to be a bias-free leader. Uh, I think it's been more, uh, the company has now decided that we need to figure out how to eliminate bias or reduce bias as much as possible. So these are the things that we'd like you to do. Um, I would say though, that at the same time, like because the, um, the need, my need to be unbiased has sort of um, prefaced any need that a company or anyone else has really kind of imposed on me. Uh, I, I feel like you've heard a little bit from my other answers where I strive um, to, to be unbiased uh, as much as possible. The other thing though, is to know, you know, it takes time and, you're never going to be unbiased. It's, it's kind of like, um, 
uh, emo emotional maturity or, or emotional intelligence is the person who says that they're emotional intelligent is a person who probably isn't. Uh, I think it's the same idea with being biased and um, achieving unbiased leadership. The leader who says that they are unbiased is, uh, is, is truly not. So um, it's the journey that Joanne mentioned before. Awesome, awesome. So um, um, Joanne, do you wanna share any of your stories? Uh, where yeah, you're I mean, I think being a woman in tech, very rarely did somebody call me out as biased because they probably view me as like a little bit more open than others. Um, I think the closest that I have had is to really advocate for other people who felt like they were having biased decisions made against them. Uh, and so kind of coming in, I've learned to be a very good moderator to listen uh, and to listen to both sides, right? Because sometimes we see bias where there really isn't any. And, you know, there's just some, there's some harsh feedback that is really hard to take. And like, that's unfortunately how it can be, even if you're like, you know, I, I have seen the scenario where I had somebody who everyone's like, oh, you should get promoted. You should get promoted. I don't know why they're not promoting you. But I had also seen the person's work and I knew exactly why they weren't getting promoted. And everyone's like, oh, it's just because you're a woman. It's because you're a woman. It's like, you know, sometimes even if you have 30 people saying like, oh, it's bias, there's actually a reason, you know? And like, sometimes it's important to tell that person like, hey, I need you to be a little bit more open-minded here. Like there is some work that needs to be done, you know? So... Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I think we are pretty close to um, 630 here, but I do want to give um, some attention to the questions posed by the audience. So Catherine, do you want to um, help me prioritize some of those? I feel like Joanna has been answering questions in the chat. Sorry. <laughs> Joanne, <laughs> I think you have like, let's see. I will say, Shiwan, people would like your email so they could connect with you on LinkedIn. Yeah, uh, so um, I think, try this one. I'm sorry. I was just looking to see if I could figure out how to change my setting. Uh, <laughs> hold on. I'll just give you my personal. Try that. If it's not that one, then it's this. This is like when I'm like, which phone number did I <laughs> do? With yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's really like that. Hey, hey Deepa, um, I actually wanted to uh, address one of the questions I think that came up. That we didn't quite get to, if that's okay. May I? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions was, how do you handle two team members who have conflicting ideas? How do you handle a peer making things hard for you whenever they get an opportunity, even after bringing this to the manager's attention? I have another example <laughs> uh, that happened to me. Um, I was working at a company, uh, this, gosh, this, this peer, he was just making things really, really hard. Just every moment, every chance, uh, it was a dig or a putting me down, putting my work down, telling me why I was wrong. Uh, it was just, and, and it came across as like the comment itself was about something was wrong with my work or my decision-making or my critical thinking skills or something like that. Um, but when it happens in quick succession and it happens every single time and it comes out like, with a really mean tone and like looking to find those errors, it just comes, it's, it's obviously something is happening there. So I honestly, like I let that happen for an entire year. I didn't know what to do. I told my boss, I was like, uh, I can't stand this person. And okay, so this is also messed up too. My boss was like, I can't stand that person either. <laughs> um, and so, it, you know, it was a very like wrong situation overall, but after a full year, I kind of finally had enough and finally was like, you know what? Like, I'm just gonna to talk to him. I'm just going to go have a conversation with him and come at it from the perspective of something's happening where we are both in this quite perverse situation, clearly, because if my boss is talking to me and sort of almost confiding in me about this person as well, then imagine how he feels. So I took it from the perspective of, and I came with the mentality of um, something wrong is happening to both of us. And literally all I said was like, hey, um, so what's going on? Like what's happening here? And that was the all, the, all that I need. That was all that we needed to break down and say, he just turned around and said, oh my gosh, thank you for saying that. I can't believe you brought this up. And we had such an open dialogue after that. 
So what I really found compelling about this question is it doesn't say that you actually tried to talk to your team member. I would highly recommend approach it, trying that, mustering up the courage to um, talk to that person and say, hey, I realize something must be going on with you. Can you tell me about what that is? Even though you're kind of in this place of, I don't want to talk to this person because they're being biased against me. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you, Shivan. I've had um, similar, I've, have, I've been in similar situations and then I have um, actually asked them if they'd like to um, go out with me for coffee and then we just kind of opened up. And then since then, we've had um, excellent uh, working relationship and um, yeah, things um, are way smoother than before. So I think we need to take that um, first step um, to address it. And then um, usually um, uh, things, um, uh, you know, start playing out well, um, uh, but occasionally um, you'll find out otherwise um, too, but then um, for the most part, we'll be able to resolve the differences. So Joanne, do you agree or? Yeah, I, I think the courageous thing to do is always to try to solve it on your own, no matter how uncomfortable it is, right? And I will add that I know right now with a pandemic, it's really hard to just go get coffee with somebody and talk to them. But, you know, the next best thing is just jump on the video call. I know it's hard, but it's like, we're all kind of alone. We're all feeling a little bit off. Like, I don't know anybody who wouldn't appreciate just the reach out to be like, hey, you know, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So are there any questions? Um, I haven't been paying attention to the um, chat box. Um, but if anybody has any questions that we haven't addressed so far, uh, please feel free to um, chime in here. And uh, we'll be glad to answer, um, get, get some answers for those. Uh, if not, um, I will take this opportunity to thank both Joanne and Shivan for um, spending more than an hour with us <laughs> um, answering all these um, difficult questions from um, the audience and uh, from the um, community here and um, helping us um, understand that awareness of unconscious bias in all forms is really important and we can't, uh, we shouldn't be ignoring that. And it's good to stay objective in order to make um, mindful decisions that are good for the team and for the company. Thanks again. Thank you, Deepa. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks everyone.